All right, let's get right to it. So hi, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, and again, please put your name in the chat. Let us know where you're from. We are a nonprofit organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state. We've been doing that for over a decade. We also have great programming, including our Friday updates like today. We have speakers from all over the world, historians, authors, elected officials, journalists, you name it. Next Friday, you can join us for a conversation with Dr. Yesenia Pizarro on the surge of firearm violence in the United States, trends and best practices for prevention. Also, if you are interested in getting more involved with our organization, we are looking for volunteers to help with our school board support initiative. And we are in the middle of a membership drive for 2023 as our membership rates are gonna be going up in 2024. If you become a member or renew your membership, we have some cool little tchotchkes here. We got a mug, we got a magnetic bumper sticker, and we also have tote bags. So if you're interested, you'll get a free little gift as supplies last. Um, but I'm really excited today uh, because we are kicking off our series about the religious rights obsession with guns. And today, I can't think of a better guest to help us kick it off. Uh, Dr. Joseph Slaughter is an associate director of the Center for the Study of Guns and Society at Wesleyan University. His research and teaching focuses on how religious movements and businesses have shaped American capitalism. His book project, Faith in Markets, demonstrates how religious identities in the United States early decades influenced economic decision making, leading to the formation of distinct visions of the emerging American capitalist system. His work also explores how religion shaped the way indigenous peoples and early American colonists approached warfare, and his current research focuses on the religious lives of 19th century U.S. firearm manufacturers. Wow, this is fascinating stuff. Um, is there anything, Dr. Slaughter, that I've missed in your bio? No, that's very wonderful. Uh, thank you. You know, and you, when it, when I first came on, I just want to mention it because you were talking about religious universities and I don't want to take you off topic. No, but that's all right. In a lot of these, like what I've noticed as I've started to track some of these religious, um, you know, whether it's a K-12 school, because now my tax dollars in Arizona go to fund the education of millionaires and billionaires in Arizona um, to put their kids in private religious schools. And what I've noticed is that these statements of faith oftentimes, not only will it say marriage is between a man and a woman, you know, um, that there's only two genders that, that uh, you know, birth begins or life begins at conception, but then they oftentimes squeeze in this other little one that's like, capitalism is awesome. <laughs> and I don't really remember that being a teaching of Jesus, but perhaps in your talk, you can help us to understand that better. <laughs> so, no, so that's, I was just, I mean, I was just was talking about that with my students this week, because I'm teaching a a seminar for first year students um, here at Wesleyan um, called Jesus Chicken. And it's about the intersection of religion and business. If you're not aware, there was some, some progressives that called Chick-fil-A Jesus Chicken in a sort of pejorative way. And then it got reappropriated by some conservatives. And anyways, it's you have to have good titles for students to be interested in these kind of things, especially at a place like Wesleyan. But as they were reading in the opening weeks from you know the New Testament teachings, Sermon on the Mount, things like that, they were puzzling over where a lot of the sort of Christian support for capitalism comes from exactly. And, um, and that's, and that was part of the reason why I wrote my book is because I felt like um, if progressive people sometimes underestimated the degree of religion being an important thing to early Americans, a lot of conservative people overestimated and didn't understand the degree to which um, a lot of very religious people had serious critiques for the capitalist system and reimagined it and market exchange looking at a very different kind of fashion from what we might um, imagine um, looking back. So, so yeah, no, those are, that's a, that's a good question. I, my students ask that all the time. <laughs> well, yeah. And I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, it's Brad Onishi and I can't remember who the other person is, but they have a podcast called Straight White American Jesus, because that's kind of the idea of Jesus that gets bandied about. Like he would not have flipped the tables. He would not have helped anybody who was poor. He would not have fed hungry people, you know, so. No, he um, wasn't I'm gonna... an Aramaic speaking person. That's for sure. 
Yeah, right. Not at all. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to just pass it off to you, John. I will monitor the comments and I'm going to turn my video off. So take it away. Sure. Um, so anyways, also just in case you wonder, um, there's some, you know, things like airplanes behind me and stuff because I actually was a Navy pilot in another era before I um, before I came to teach at Wesleyan. So I'm a little bit of an odd duck in that regard. But actually, my whole interest in this as a subject started a couple of years ago as I was kind of getting into the publication phase of my book and trying to think about what I wanted to work on next. And I had some international students because we have a number of international students um, here at Wesleyan who come with you know very interesting perspectives from different um, places and cultures. And very oftentimes, you might be surprised to know that a lot of these international students are Christians coming from places like China or West Africa. And they're oftentimes confused about some of the things that are bundled together with Christianity in America, because for them, they might share some of the theologically conservative types of approaches in a Christian sense, but don't understand why there is, for instance, this obsession with firearms. Because, you know, a South Korean says that there are very few firearms. Most of us are opposed to these sorts of things. And yet I believe in a lot of the same conservative things as a Presbyterian Korean, as, you know, a white suburban, you know, Christian in America does. And I don't understand where they get this biblical justification and that sort of thing. And I didn't have a very good answer for those international students who were wondering why some of these things were bundled together in an American Christian context. And so I started just, I, I first just started thinking about it. And, and then I started, you know, being involved in the topic more organically because a colleague of mine asked me to help start a research center here at Wesleyan where we would look at the history of firearms. Um, you know, it might be surprising or not, I'm not sure, to know that while there are some really good um, um, centers for the study as it relates to law, like at Duke, and, and they do a lot of great Second Amendment work as it pertains to firearms, and there are some really good public health initiatives at places like Johns Hopkins, there are not research centers that focus on it from a historical perspective. And part of that is... Um, some unfortunate situations that have happened in the past when people have tried to study it. Some of it is lack of um, funding from the federal and state levels and others have to do with just being such a controversial issue and it's difficult to sometimes fundraise, um, particularly knowing that you don't wanna take money from firearms manufacturers on one hand, but if you take money from advocates on the other, um, you know, the other side will discount your research. So, uh, you know, we've been working on that for the last two years, getting this center started and have had a lot of good, you know, uh, initial discussions. And as I got more working in that and then had this interest from students and uh, was teaching in Wesleyan, which is, if you're not aware, sort of the heart of the original gun manufacturing industry in the United States from New Haven, where Whitney had a plant, all the way up to the Springfield Armory, following along the Connecticut River Valley. It was a mecca of the kind of skilled craftsmanship and the mechanization that was necessary to turn it from a, 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 a very sort of small scale artisan type project into an industrial commercial type enterprise um, by the Civil War and thereafter. And, you know, surrounded by that history, and increasingly seeing people campaign on these like God and guns type platforms and seeing these sort of things show up on t-shirts and bumper stickers. Uh, I just, you know, I was sort of confused, um, particularly because growing up, I was aware of more of the Peace Church tradition. I remember going to a high school basketball game at Goshen College, which is a Mennonite institution in Northern Indiana. And this was right after sort of the first Gulf War and everybody was playing Lee Greenwood music and all those sorts of things. And they didn't do the national anthem. I turned to one of my friends and said, oh, why didn't they do the national anthem here? And he's like, well, they're Mennonites, idiot. You know, like they, 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 have a, they have a different view of allegiance to God and country and those sorts of things. And they're pacifists, so they're unsettled by this war. And, you know, that was an educational moment for me. Um, so, you know, to be sort of hit in the face with, a much more militarized sort of Christianity that embraces these guns as a part of an identity was something very curious to me and something I decided I wanted to try to teach a course on. And so I will say that you're joining me 
as I'm trying to figure out this project, uh, hopefully within a couple of years, there might be a book that I will have written that will try to lay out some of what I think is just sort of hypothetical at this point with only a barest amount of research to back it up, but would be a little bit more empirical and um, a little bit more organized um, with my apologies, what I'll be presenting you today. I don't think there is a single like smoking gun in the story. I think it's a series of signposts and maybe moments. And that's what I'm going to just try to do today. I'm going to give you three of those. I'm going to look at first sort of the founding era, you know, Revolutionary War sort of period, and then jump to sort of the pre civil war period and then jump again to sort of the cold war era and just try to look at snapshots or signposts of american culture in those particular um uh, moments and i think you should feel free to ask questions as we're going along if there's things that i need to clarify or um, restate or explain i'm happy to do that but uh, my apologies again this isn't going to be comprehensive and i'm probably going to leave you not quite satisfied and fulfilled, which would be good because then you can just buy my book in a few years. And then uh, hopefully it'll be more clear to both you and me at that point. But I'm going to start here where I where I do oftentimes chronologically when I teach my God and Guns course, um, which I taught for the first time last semester. And I'm going to try to do my best here to share my screen with you. Um, so just bear with me here uh, for one moment. All right. Uh, so a lot of a lot of this is um, trying to figure out one, both the cultural river of religion and the rhetoric around religion in this moment, and then also the reality of firearms in this era, because there's a lot of sort of mythology. And, and when I mean mythology, I'm not necessarily meaning in terms of not being true, but stories that people are telling that are very critical to their identity, particularly amongst conservative Christians about this era. And I'm going to kind of start with this, and you'll see I'm going to kind of end with this sort of mythology again. And this picture here really represents it. You know, it's this ideal of this Minuteman militia sort of thing that is resisting tyranny and standing up for freedoms that you see in this in this painting right here which is you know trying to represent you know sort of lexington and concord in the in the beginning of the american revolution as it's oftentimes um described in people's imaginations and even a lot of textbooks and at the at the same time one of the things i think is really important to understand about um just the religious rhetoric are the, these these stories that people tell about declension and decline that's the con you know that's the sort of famous idea of a of of a, of a jeremiah and that it's always sort of centered around this idea of the covenant and even though the covenant is born out of a very sort of calvinistic view of christianity that isn't nearly as popular today as it was back in the 1700s it's a latent thing that is still in the back of the way a lot of people think about how God treats nations and individuals and communities. And it's why oftentimes there is so much emotion revolving around um, cultural issues because they feel like this is a, a circumstance with eternal consequences, not just for them, but for the whole country as, as, as a large, as a whole. And so, like I said, you know, it, it, it revolves around this, you know, perpetual story of decline that things are getting worse and worse and worse. And only a turn back to God is, is how you're going to fix those things. And it also is very important to sort of stress that um, for people that um, sort of use this myth as a powerful story informing their identity, a providential history and a providential view of violence are also intrinsic to this. A certainty about what God is doing and also a certainty about that God is willing to carry out judgment through violent means and that that is okay. Um, so that's sort of, you know, a lot, I think a lot of the religious sort of rhetoric as a foundation is important to understand. In terms of the militia, I think I'm going to sort of breeze through this because I think some of the subsequent speakers to me in your uh, series are going to do a good job of highlighting some of these things. But just I think the key points to understand is there were a lot of firearms in early America. There weren't a lot of handguns with the exception of in South Carolina where there were mounted slave patrols. Um, but they were also not the kind 
of firearms that you would take to battle. They were not muskets. A musket was a term that meant you could stick a bayonet on the end of it, and it was a military grade um, a firearm. Most of these were older pieces that were used for hunting. Um, they were not really ready to be brought out and used in warfare. And in fact, the colonies always struggled in times of need to field enough military grade weapons. And oftentimes, were looking to fund and manufacture, get their hands on these weapons, and then put them into the hands of the drilling militia. So um, yes, people have guns, but they're they're not the right kinds, and they're certainly not you know firearms that people are are are, are carrying around concealed or even even uh, you know a handgun type weapon which is clearly meant for another human being and not an animal. Um, those those kind of weapons are, are are not as common. It's also important to understand that you know New England for much of the 16 even 1700s is a war zone, whether it's with indigenous people or the Spanish or the French or the Dutch, um, or eventually the British. And so you know drilling was you know a duty that was a form of citizenship, and it was also a sign of one's full sort of participation um, as as a citizen um, as well. Um, just just a couple sort of peculiarities you know the in terms of uh you know things like bacon's rebellion which if you're not in, uh, aware it's a, a huge um, uprising by slaves in the 1670s and that was that was a that was a time where then after that virginia very much restricted for instance black people from participating in the militia or other other people that were seen as maybe liabilities in, ter in terms of their loyalty, such as indigenous people that may have surprisingly um, to some of us um, been included in those kind of militia opportunities prior to that. And places like Pennsylvania, because of Quakerism, really don't have the number of firearms that are present elsewhere. Um, and a lot of that derives from sort of the pacifism of the Quaker system, as well as it not fielding a militia. And that being, um, especially by the Seven Years' War in the 1750s and 60s, a source of a lot of tension in their society. South Carolina has lots and lots of arms. And a lot of that is because of the number of enslaved people there and the need for slave patrols, as I mentioned um, before. Um, a couple other just sort of notion, you know, things that are important to note, just in terms of comparing a brown best musket, which is also a much heavier weapon um, to a hunting rifle, which is a much lighter, different kind of caliber weapon. And in particular, um, it's again, not until the 1770s did colonists really start emphasizing this concept of a well-regulated militia, which now we know from the Second Amendment that phrase. And, and quite frankly, a lot of times the, the militias were not well regulated, which is why in the 1770s, they're very much emphasizing that as an important sort of concept. And, and militia performs very unevenly. George Washington, Hamilton, others want to establish a, uh, a, a national army, a national navy, because they were very disillusioned by the performance of the militia all through the American revolutions, which is obviously different from sort of the, the mythological conception of it. And after the war, the number of, of, of guns um, does begin to decline um, in comparison. So one, one other thing that I just want to mention in terms about the rhetoric of this early American period before I jump to the Civil War period is that Judges 5, which maybe many of us are not familiar of, with because I don't think even if you grew up in a church context, you probably heard a sermon about Judges 5. But it's about this um, character, Yael, who uh, takes a tent peg to the temple of the Canaanite general Sisera, who's an enemy of ancient Israel. And um, she's then glorified in the Song of Deborah, Deborah being one of these judges, a female judge in the ancient sort of Israelite history as this, you know, amazing servant of God who slew, you know, Israel's enemy in this incredibly violent sort of way. Well, you know, this becomes sort of an archetype in the 16 and even in the 1700s in New England. And these, you know, statues of people like Hannah Dustin with her, her axe here, who were sort of contemporary examples of Yael in colonial America, particularly in fighting against um, indigenous peoples. And it's the most preached on passage in war 
from the 1670s through the 1770s. So for 100 years, this is most commonly the passage that's used, this Judges 4 and 5 account of Yael and the Song of Deborah celebration afterwards um, in sermons from the pulpit in um in the Americas. So that's I think that's a that's an interesting reminder in terms of the way in which violence um flowed oftentimes from the pulpits. And although we're not speaking specifically about firearms here, clearly, you know, there's an intersection there, I think, and that's not insignificant to um to consider. All right. So next I'm going to switch to my um, focus on the Civil War, okay? So we're going to jump to um, talking about uh, sort of uh, firearms in a slightly different context on the eve of the Civil War as, as it pertains to first um, a character like Nat Turner, who if you're not familiar, Nat Turner is um, a fascinating character. He's um, uh, a person who's um, coming from an enslaved background. He's trying to lead an insurrection. They they succeed in um, killing a number of uh, uh, planters, wives, children. It gets sensationalized in the press. There's a famous uh, publication, Nat Turner's Confessions, where a journalist purports to interview him. Most historians feel like half of it is a complete fraud and uh, complete sensationalized account. The other half of it, a lot of historians think, is probably a more accurate rendering of some of Nat Turner's views. And particularly, Turner was an ardent um, Christian. He grew up in St. Luke's Parish um, and and in and in the in the material of um of uh of of Nat Turner's confessions is interesting because he cites a lot of passages from Luke. And Luke happens to contain in the gospel account material that's not found in the other gospels, um, accounts that are actually very essential to Turner's worldview. Um, Luke also emphasizes prayer a lot, which is very central to uh, Turner's testimony. Um, after the after the fact, after he's captured. And Luke also emphasizes the Holy Spirit quite a bit in his gospel, which is also central to Nat Turner. And Nat Turner, um, one of the marks of this was, um, you know, seizing firearms, using them against um, white people and particularly plantation owners and, and their families. And it's very unsettling for Southerners to be confronted with you know, a, a a black man who's espousing many of these, you know, passages that they're that they're familiar with. So one example would be Luke twelve, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Um, this is this he uses this exact phrase. He talks about the baptism of Christ and um, also the baptism of the Spirit of God, which you know maybe some Pentecostals um, out there would would recognize. And the idea of the first being last and the last being first. These are all just a, a, like a smattering of examples of how somebody who used violence, used firearms, and used religious rhetoric to wage their war against oppressors in the in the in the pre-Civil War era. And and I like to include this because in my students' conception, we have a sort of you know, and I'm guilty of this oftentimes too, sort of pejorative view about people that are mixing gods and, and God and guns. And yet at the same time, our first instinct is to valorize somebody like Nat Turner. And maybe it's still okay that we do, but I think it's also okay to understand the degree to which, you know, religion and very specifically certain passages from the gospel of Luke were part of the motivating factor and the way Turner thought that he was divinely appointed to wage this war against um, slave owners. And here are some other different passages, again, that were attributed to Nat Turner in the part of this confessions that historians think is probably more accurately a representation of, of Turner's views. So that's, so that's one, um, one half of sort of the Civil War discussion. The, the other half, and I'm going to just click through here briefly, would be a character like John Brown. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure if any of you watch Good Lord Bird, uh, that series that I think it was on Amazon uh, not too long ago it came out. 
uh, it's a very sensationalized account of John Brown. I mean, I find it highly entertaining. Uh, so, you know, I recommend it from an entertainment standpoint. I think they look at John Brown as like a crazy um, sort of freak. And I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that part of his depiction, but they do try to highlight the degree to which he is using um, Christianity to um, underpin his endeavors. And so I think, you know, that part of it is, is helpful. Um, I think that John Brown knew his Christianity better than the good Lord Berg gives him credit for. But just some of the basics, if you're less familiar, you know, he's most famous for this 1859 raid on Harper's Ferry that a lot of his historians attribute then to sort of touching off the Civil War because of how much it regalvanized the Southern militia system and invested them with a belief that the radical abolitionist cause, which they also attributed to Lincoln, even though that's not an accurate historical attribution, was coming for them and coming for their slaves and coming for their guns. And he very much um, claimed to be driven by the golden rule, which you know might be curious if you know about his mission in places like Bleeding Kansas, where he hacks pro-slavery um, settlers uh, to death with machetes, uh, but uh, still at the same time, uh, sort of claimed to be driven by this golden rule on behalf of enslaved people. And um, as I said, is probably one of the sparks of the Civil War. If you read, he has a, a slew of letters that are published after he's captured at Harper's Ferry. He survives him sort of miraculously, and he's in prison, and he does a lot of letter writing. And just one after another, he's just quoting verses like nonstop to relatives, to acquaintances and such in very coherent manner. And I actually have my students watch the first episode of Good Lord Bird, and then I have them read these prison letters. And they almost can't believe it's the same person because of how differently he presents in these letters from how he's portrayed in this sort of Hollywood rendering that depicts him as something of like a religious maniac. And instead, they see a very sort of calm, sort of rationalistic, and in many ways, intelligent sounding character who seems to really know his scripture very well and uses it to inform his, you know, sort of violent abolitionism. Again, this is just a list of uh, verses that you'll find in these different letters. And just these are just a few out of many that are in his collection. And you can there's some of these are digitized online and others you can you can get them through interlibrary um, loan. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to stop there with John Brown. So that's my 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 second signpost. And I'm going to now jump to my third signpost, if I can get it to here, which would be the Cold War era. And get the right slide to share here. Okay. And and some of this, um, some of this I definitely will take an assist from Kristen Dumay, a colleague of mine at Calvin who wrote Jesus and John Wayne. I'm not sure if any of you read that, but it's a wonderful book to read if you haven't read it. it. Made the New York Times bestseller the old way through word of mouth and through um, sort of excellent research and writing. And she very much introduces into this story, I think, um, sort of the, the importance of the, the gender dynamic uh, of the Cold War and sort of post-Cold War period. And so just as a brief overview, you know, sort of if, if we talk about sort of the the Victorian era and in particular cult of domesticity and 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 how women are viewed the Victorian era is a, is a is a time when women are are changing in how they're being viewed by particularly sort of Protestant Americans of of middle and upper middle class these are two different images from illustrated bibles the one in the lower right was published in the 1830s the other one on the upper left 1840s and in the lower right, you see Bathsheba bathing in the city, sort of in the open, provocatively. And then you see um, up in the upper right of this image, um, sort of King David. And it's almost like he can't go out of his way to notice this sort of provocative woman. On the other hand, in the, in the image on the left, about a decade later, you see now um, instead, Bathsheba is being very modest and she's covered up and she's 
she's really sort of taking pains to bathe in secret and in modesty. And it's almost like in the back here, you have David as a peeping Tom sort of leering at her um, when, when he's clearly invading her private moment here in bathing. And this just reflects how women increasingly, and this is a series of images from the same illustrated Bible on the upper left, um, published by Harper and Brothers in the 1840s, how much women were coming to be ascribed with values of virtue and religiosity and piety, not the temptress and the wanton sort of um, passionate creatures of more of the Middle Ages and early modern period. And so that what you have here is, you know, sort of Eve and her new, you know, baby, you know, probably, I guess, Abel. And, you know, you can see she's, you know, maybe she's, you know, deliriously more happy at having just nursed her baby than probably most women ever are. But then countered here with also these views of women from the Psalms, all personifying uh, virtues that are not explicitly gendered necessarily, but they're sort of imbuing them with this sort of um, Victorian feminine sort of quality of piety. You know, these women, they're looking upward. They're in also very much domestic sort of orientations, as both of these suggest, in emphasizing, you know, the woman's value in trying to raise up, you know, sort of children. And, and so if we sort of think about that as sort of a foundation of this idea of domesticity, sentimentality, but then this concern with over-civilization, which gives way to, at the end of the of the 19th century, a muscular Christianity embodied by, a, you know, a sort of an extreme example like Billy Sunday, who, you know, is a famous ball player and then becomes sort of the Billy Graham of his era as an incredibly successful evangelist. He's trading on this coin of muscular Christianity and this idea that we've become too feminized in our Christianity, that the Victorian sort of thing was good, but it went too far. And it, you know, feminized our view of Jesus and of what it means to be a Christian and particularly for what it means to be a Christian man. Um, this is, you know, I, I always love this quote uh, from a, a newspaper of the time illustrating and trying to explain the mode of Billy Sunday's evangelism, which was just incredibly physical and um, sort of over the top in many ways. And there are a few, you can Google them, there are a few videos that were that are out there on YouTube, you know, later in his life, you know, we do have, you know, recordings and such, but he was older by then, and they don't quite do justice to what he was in his prime. As a little personal aside, I totally took for granted the fact that uh, when I was in middle school and high school, I actually rode by Billy Sunday's um, house um, in Indiana routinely and walked by it on my way to the bus. And uh, now I have all this appreciation for this history that, you know, as a young person, I had no appreciation for whatsoever. But that personal um, bit aside, you can also talk about things like the YMCA, Young Men's Christian Association, is another expression of this. And then the militarism that we see in World War I. Um, um, and then, and then um, a book, The Man Nobody Knows, that really um, sort of tries to present Jesus as a businessman and the disciples as like entrepreneurs in many ways. And so then bringing in that sort of aspect of manhood and imbuing it with a sort of, um, of um, uh, sort of sanctity, so to speak. And then, you know, uh, you know, this this moment when Billy Graham emerges, and this is where I think a lot of the good points that Christian Dumay come into play, is also this moment where there's a popularity in the sort of masculine cowboy um, sort of image. And the John Wayne archetype that is so popular with Christians, even though he's not a Christian character, and in many ways, he's sort of the antithesis of Jesus, helps sort of reshape people's view of what Jesus is into, you know, maybe a masculine, straight, um, outdoorsman, warrior type of figure. And, and it should be underscored, and Dume does a good job of emphasizing that this also takes place in, in the context of the Cold War and the militarization that happens in lots of levels of our society, politically, um, for sure, within Christianity. 
and then and then the shift at the same time towards this Goldwater conservatism that embraces this. And 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 Graham, although in the eighties, sort of disavowed his connection to uh, Richard Nixon, especially when he's burned by these tapes uh, where he speaks derogatively about Jewish people, which these tapes have subsequently been coming out in the last couple of years as they've been getting released um, by his archive are actually worse than we thought um, originally, um, sadly, uh, sad to say, um, sort of ensconce this connection um, between these. Um, and it sort of starts to form the nucleus of the emergence of the religious right, which you know, comes to be, of course, you know, a, a very um, sort of tight fit with uh, with the firearm culture of the NRA and others. And one of the people that I think embodies this is Oliver North. And um, as another sort of personal aside, before I came to Wesleyan, I was teaching at the Naval Academy. And when I was there, he came to speak to um, a gathering of midshipmen. I I don't I don't quote me on this because I don't remember whether it was a Protestant group or just a broadly Christian group, but um, they brought him in. It was very quietly done. I'm not. It's still not totally clear on to me why he came in, whether it was um, driven by him, another friend of his, or what exactly. But he he came to speak, and I want to say this is around 2018, 2019. I have it written down. I don't remember exactly right offhand. But he was still the president of the NRA at the time, and um, he he was speaking ostensibly as a Christian person, but he was also speaking as the president of the NRA. And his whole talk, which I have extensive notes from, was just weaving those two things together in just a, sort of a mind-blowing sort of way. Um, for for me to hear, even though I'm not sure that a lot of people in the audience thought about it as critically. Um, because he went in great detail about his born again experience and the the degree to which being a Christian was vital to him as um, a public servant, and then also even weaving this into the mythology of his appearance before um, the Iran Contra um, investigation in Congress, um, to his now service as the as the as the as the president of the um, NRA. And one of the things, and this is where I'm going to bring this back into a conclusion here and connect it with the very beginning mythology, is, you know, he's very much representative of this sort of Reagan 80s, you know, fusion of the Western traditionalism, anti-communism and free markets. But it's also this moment where there's this conservative turn theologically within evangelicalism in places like the Southern Baptist Convention. And Oliver North, you know, you know, I think most of you are aware of sort of his historical moment. But more recently, he wrote this novel called The Rifleman. And it's not great literature, but you can get it um, on Amazon relatively cheaply if you're um, an enterprising individual. And what he does here is really mythologize a Christian nationalist sort of ideology into a, a, a work that purports to be historical. And he tries to tell this story of sort of Virginia militia um, revolutionary service through the eyes of a young boy who's growing up and learning not only about military service and manhood, but also about Christianity through these various characters that he's coming into contact with in, um, in the years of the American Revolution. Um, he, he, he not only, I mean, he does terrible injustice to just the diversity and the complexity of the religious landscape of early America, but he also sort of also ahistorically imports evangelical values of his political community into this story and sort of trying to make a very clear argument about the historical connection and veracity of, you know, their his concerns and his community's concerns about things like guns and premarital sex and gender norms and all these sorts of things. And it's ironic because um, conservatives oftentimes accuse liberal scholars of being presentist, like things like the 1619 Project of importing progressive concerns back into the historical record. And, I, you know, I think that that's not without merit. I'm sure that me and my colleagues do that. But I will also say that you know, this is a good example of where it happens just as, you know, egregiously in conservative circles as well. 
And, um, and I think that in many ways also sort of my final thought for this is that a guy like Ollie North in his fusion of Christianity and firearms really provided also a template that is copied today in sort of performative politics, um, because that's very much what he was doing in the Iran-Contra affair and um, was sort of probably ahead of his time in that moment. But I very much see echoes and legacies of people like a, you know, General, um, you know, Flynn and other types like that, who sort of represent that sort of fusion today in sort of the sort of Trump um, political climate. So I'll stop there. I probably went um, a little bit longer, maybe 10 minutes longer than you wanted me to. So I apologize for that. I'll stop my uh, my share of my screen and I'll be happy to you know, converse with people with the time we have left. Uh, no worries. Uh, there are there's some comments going on here. Um, somebody's uncle was actually named after Billy Sunday. Um, oh, wow. Wonderful. Some, someone else didn't know that YMCA was a Christian organization. Yep. I, yes. I remember. Yeah, I remember when I first learned that it was a while back, but I was I had no idea before then. Um, let's see. John says this fascinating talk. Another slant. Steve Pinker suspects that the difference in violent behavior between North and South can be traced back to the origins of the immigrants. New Englanders came from law abiding landowners and arable farmers in East Anglia. I wonder if that's East Angola, whereas most immigrants to the um, to the south were Scots, Irish ranchers, and sheep farmer ranchers. Without the benefits of law enforcement and a civil society, were more likely to settle their differences violence. This gave rise to the honor culture where social slights provoke violent reactions. Pinker reports that when Harvard undergrads were subjected to minor insults like brushing shoulders in a quarter, um, students from the South were statistically more likely to act confrontationally. He conjectures that the enormous rate of black on black gun violence in Chicago may be a relic of the honor culture inherited from the South and transported North during the great migration of the 1930s. Um, so there's a very lengthy comment. Don, and I don't know if you have anything to say about that, but Don says that culture of honor, the psychology of violence in the South is an old book, but it explains a lot of the psychology of those differences in culture in the South. As someone who is from the South, it was a hard book for me to read 25 years ago, but it helped me understand and process a lot. Mm -hmm. um, she goes on to say that Steve Pinker's book is a more modern take on that same research and she started it a while back, but now she's gonna bump it up on her list. Um, New Mexico Skies says, but today Southerners live in McMansions in a suburban development, so why are they still so confrontational? <laughs> I don't know if that is a rhetorical question. Um, because we were all raised that way, Don says. I still hear people say the South will rise again. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I have friends who live in the South and they are, I mean, you know, we've had speakers on here who have said this before, Jeff Charlotte, um, you know, mm -hmm. as we are in a slow civil war. Mm -hmm. So this idea of like, you know, defending their homeland, it, it runs, you know, they still kind of feel like they're there to protect their Southern ideologies, I guess. Um, Peter's asking in the Q and A, did the John Birch Society have a religious aspect? Oh yeah, no, that's a really good question. You know, I so I mean, I've thought a, I've thought a lot about this um, because um, not I mean, not overtly, but there were definitely religious people that were involved in it. So, would one good example would be somebody like um, um, Rush Dooney, who's like the founder of Christian Reconstructionism, and in many ways is sort of the founder of the Christian legal movement today. He wrote this institutes um, of these huge volumes of basically trying to transliterate Levitical and Deuteronomy sort of law into like American jurisprudence. And kind of, especially at a law school like, um, Regent in Virginia Beach, Pat Robertson's um, organization. You know, I, I I don't know that they're opening it up today, but it sort of created a roadmap for people to think that way. And he was involved in John Burke Society, um, so there were definitely people like that who were very sort of conservative Christians who were involved in it. There were certainly lots of grassroots people who we know, you know, were also very conservative, you know, sort of Christian, um, you know, not just people like him, but a lot of um, 
women in Orange County and places like that, that, you know, had Bible studies and such. And I think that the interesting thing about John Birch Society is I think it just was before its moment. If it would have been in a social media age, I think it'd be every bit as impactful and impossible to marginalize as a lot of these conspiracy groups are today. The difference was back then, sort of the gatekeepers of the Republican establishment could like squash it and marginalize it in a way that they just are powerless to do now in the sort of social media age. Um, there is a question here from Ravon and she, uh, let's see, J.P. Stevens, uh, Supreme Court 1975 to 2010, advocated to repeal the Second Amendment as a relic and as a gift to the NRA. Is a repeal possible? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, as a historian, I look backwards and not future uh, forwards, but I'm, I'm not optimistic about that. That's for sure. No, I'm I'm definitely uh, not optimistic about that either. Um, so uh, there's no more questions here, but um, I do realize that what was it yesterday, sometime earlier this week, Biden put together some kind of gun safety um, council or something like that. Uh, and I don't know if you, uh, I don't know if you know the details on that, but I mean, do you think this is just kind of like you know, uh, performative, because it just kind of feels like nothing has been done so far. Everybody sends thoughts and prayers after the latest mass shooting. And, and we all go along, you know, I mean, I, we're all so desensitized to it at this point. Honestly, when I see something trending on Twitter, like, and I'm like, oh, it's only two people that are killed. Like that's, kind, and I, and I, it's terrible to admit that, but like, that is where we are. Do you think that this you know, committee or consortium or whatever it is that he's put together is going to have any teeth and make any kind of difference at all? Well, I'm not optimistic at the moment, but not for the reasons you're describing, although I'm very sympathetic and share a lot of those views. Um, I actually am more sort of concerned because just as a historian, if anyone's familiar with the Bruin decision from last summer, which established for the first time ever the right of people to carry firearms constitutionally outside of their homes. So if Heller previously for the first time ever um, established the right of people to um, have guns in their home for personal defense, um, then Bruin took that the step further and said that people have that constitutional right outside their homes. And the second part that is more of a problem, which is being dealt with right now and why I'm pessimistic, is because um, Scalia's um, decision said that the measure of all regulations was whether there was a historical analogy at the time of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And so, for instance, you know, the Rahimi decision is being, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how the Supreme Court um, rules on that, because that one was a situation where trying to deny a, a you know person who is um, a, a threat of domestic violence from having a firearm is you know allowed to have a firearm because there's no historical analogy for restricting firearms from you know um, abusers in you know the 1780s. Um, now we can we can talk about why there aren't why there aren't laws um, for that then. And, you know, there's a lot we can talk about the status of women and you know other sorts of things about that. But the bigger problem just for historians is that trying to, one, come up with historical contexts that um, are informative and help lead to better jurisprudence is one thing. But then um, getting people that make these decisions to actually understand the history and not just cherry pick the one person out of a hundred, which is like sort of telling them what they want to hear or to rely on, um, you know, clerks who aren't trained historians and don't have the time or the bandwidth to do the kind of historical research to inform these things is just really concerning because, I mean, they're throwing out laws left and right right now because the judges just say this is what the supreme court told us we have to use as a measure of the legality of these regulations and we can't find a historical analogy so you know it must be an invalid regulation um let's see and timmy reminded me that it is called the white house office on gun violence 
Uh, and RG, RJ follows up by saying, um, it's the Office of Gun Violence Prevention in partnership with other gun prevention organizations, including Moms Demand Action. The office is real with BP Harris running the office. Well, that gives me a little bit more hope. Diane points out that there's a case coming up next Supreme Court term on whether domestic abusers can be forbidden guns. If they said no, expect thousands more women to be murdered. Mm -hmm. That's the Rahimi case that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and then Samantha wants to know, uh, I see your hand is up, Marjorie, but if you want to just type in your question, I can do it that way. Um, let's see. Sa Samantha would like to know what other types of classes do you teach? <laughs> um, so um, I'm, you know, I teach, I teach things on, um, you know, sort of the in intersection of business and religion. So I have you know, this class that I'm talking about right now, and I have an upper level version of that that I teach. And um, and then I also teach classes on sort of the history of evangelicalism and fundamentalism. So I had a class called Trump Evangelicals a couple of years ago that I ran sort of during the Trump era and such like that. So um, those, are, those are the kind of things I, I, I teach. So I try to teach usually the the the, the common theme is, is some sort of sort of Christianity in North America. Um, I also teach a war and religion class in sort of early America, and and that that one we look a lot at guns and rhetoric and violence, and and also try to pay attention to the nonviolent traditions in American history. People like the Sandemanians or the or the Quakers, Moravians, and others who were you know very important um, and not insignificant voices that unfortunately we don't hear as much of today. Mm -hmm. I, I bet I would have loved to have taken the Trump and evangelicals class just because I don't get it. And I don't think that your class would even clarify it for me, but no, yeah. probably not. And that, that class came again from questions I got. I gave a talk at the Smithsonian about um, sort of history of evangelicalism. And that, that was all the questions I was getting was just like nonstop about that. And I was like, well, okay, I'm going to have to try to, I'm going to have to try to explore this more myself because these are, incredibly valid and insightful questions and I don't know the answers to them yeah no I've like completely given up trying to understand like the how how somebody who's part of that base level of support you know those really like true blue everything that he says they just fall for it I you I, I can't make sense of them anymore and in fact like I have to remember too because just just yesterday, I actually went to a governing board meeting and there's this operative there from Turning Point USA. Our paths cross frequently. Um, and every time I try to say hello to her, she looks like she, she's she's completely disgusted that I would ever even talk to her, you know, like, but it's just a normal thing to do. I mean, like if I saw, you know, if I saw somebody that I really don't care for politically, I'd still probably say hello to them. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just, so she freaks out and I have to remind myself, oh, she literally thinks I'm a devil. Like she truly no, does. Yeah. yeah. She, thinks, she thinks you're evil. And I think, and I, and, and I, I would say that you're probably on to at least one of the answers and that it's when you, when you inculcate people with a visceral sense of fear, it leads you to believe that um, because you're fighting a battle, sort of maybe any means are acceptable to try to win that battle, including, you know, the support of a bully or, you know, what, you know, what it might, what, however we might characterize somebody like Trump or something. Oh, yeah, I, I actually, somebody sent a little postcard to me. I, I kind of think it may be the same person. And it was all about how you know, I have fallen um, and that, you know, I'm on Satan's path and that, you know, that that the God's real followers have a solution for me. And I took it as a threat. I even called the police just to kind of let them know because this is the world we live in these days. But they were using scripture to justify, like, if I still stick with my evil ways, well, then true followers of Christ by any means necessary can take care of me. Mm. So that was a little disconcerting. Um, at, but not uncommon, you know, we've started this school board support initiative and the things that these people say uh, to volunteer school board members who just happen to, you know, care about their community and their local public schools, they literally accuse them of, of, of being demonic um, and, you know, of course, to hurl out insults like pedophile, groomer, indoctrinator, stuff like that. Meanwhile, 
you know, my tax dollars are no going to religious institutions that can truly indoctrinate children. So um, let's see, it looks like we have one uh, last question comment here. Uh, would registration of all firearms and licensing of gun owners and users actually do more to curb gun violence instead of trying to ban one narrow class of weapon that isn't used in most gun crime, although mass shootings are most newsworthy in their horrible consequences. I don't know, maybe. I have a, a good friend of mine, um, John Ismay. He's a classmate of mine from the Naval Academy, and he was an explosive ordnance disposal man um, before he um, went to report on um, both international and domestic um, um, violence, and particularly the use of um, different kinds of, uh, you know, sort of heavy military grade weaponry. And um, he he sort of thinks that the only real solution is banning high capacity magazines, that that's really the, the only sort of solution that, um, you know, is going to start limiting, you know, these, these mass shootings and things. Um, so he knows my, you know, he knows a lot more about that and has reported more on it than I have. So I sort of defer to him on that. So I, I don't know, I would, you know, next time I see him, maybe I'll ask him what he thinks about, you know, the registry, you know, sort of thing. Right on. There's a ton of links that are being shared. Um, yes, if anybody, somebody asked for the transcript of this chat, and if you'd like that, you can send an email to info at secularazd.org, and we can get that to you, but you're going to have to reach out. Um, so it is 12.59. I want to honor your time. I want to honor everybody who's here. I want to honor their time. Um, so, you know, I, I often say this because our Friday discussions can be a little hopeless. The world's, mm. uh, you know, literally on fire. And, mm. You know, things are, things feel crazy right now. We're all going through like a collective kind of angst. So, you know, what's something these days Dr. Slaughter, that gives you hope? Mm. Well, I would say as a, as a historian, things have been um, dark before in the United States and they get better. So I'm not somebody that believes in a, I'm not somebody that believes in either necessarily a historical declension or necessarily a story of historical progressivism necessarily. But I do think that things change and you do have moments where things seem darker. And then I think um, there are times when people's minds on things change. I don't, as again, as a historian, I, I don't predict the future, but that oftentimes helps me. Um, like for instance, when I'm feeling very depressed about sort of the political rhetoric of the moment or the things that I see being said about political enemies. And then if you go back and you read the things that were written um, in the 1790s, the late 1790s, uh, whether they were from supporters of Adams towards Jefferson or Jefferson towards Adams in the highly charged election of 1800, um, it makes me realize that we've had these moments before we've lived through these moments. Um, we've gotten through these moments and I don't know that, that, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that makes other people feel good, but it always makes me feel good to feel like this is not necessarily maybe the most unprecedented moment ever. And it's not maybe the darkest moment ever. And, you know, that there are things that are way better, you know, when we look in the past and we see, you know, you know, thousands and thousands of enslaved people in America. Um, I'm very thankful that I live in a moment where that's not the reality. Um, and that although there is lots of racial injustice that we still have to work towards eradicating and police violence and those sorts of things, which are just tragedies, um, you know, that was something that changed in a moment where I'm sure people who wanted that to end were incredibly depressed at one moment and couldn't see that there would ever be an end to that system. Um, now, <laughs> I, I know you're not praying types, but uh, so let's hope, or, you know, if people are praying types, pray that, you know, we don't end up having a civil war to get to, you know, our next better moment in that regard. Uh, but uh, that that would be, you know, sort of as a historian, that sort of context, you know, helps me at least try to stay a little sane. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, you know, lucky for me, I get to, um, see a lot more it's happening more and more i've been active in local arizona politics now for i don't know like almost 20 years 
And what I'm seeing more and more of is that the demographic of some of these political meetings that I go to is changing um, mm. and it's becoming younger uh, mm. and it's becoming way more diverse and it's becoming way more inclusive. Mm. So I, I have a lot of faith in, um, in, Gen, in the millennials and Gen Z. I'm Gen X for myself, but I, you know, I just hope that our planet can kind of chug on through until they <laughs> actually until they, you know, actually take the reins because that's yeah. that and the courts, climate change yeah. and the courts, I think are probably my, my biggest concerns. But anyway, this was a fantastic discussion. I encourage everybody to look up Dr. Uh, Slaughter and support the work that he does. Um, and I appreciate all of you taking time out of your Friday. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thanks again, Dr. Slaughter. I appreciate you. All right. Thanks everybody. Take care. All right. Bye everybody.